Good night. Okay, I just need to, um, you know, it's always a. Uh... Okay, this should be okay for my network. And, um, okay, you're good to begin, Naomi. Thank you, Dix. So, good afternoon, kind of noonish. Um, everyone, we are the MSR or Mining Software Repositories team. And today we'll be discussing our research in detecting and preventing crypto jacking injections using a complexity based decision process. Next slide, please. Our team consists of myself, Naomi Albert, Elias Morado, Benjamin Padgett, and Anshika Patel. Our technical directors are William McCoulter and Matthew Elder from the Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And our faculty advisor is Dr. Sherman. Next slide, please. Before we get into the nitty gritty of our methods and results, we'd like to mention why we did this and why we think it's important and a worthwhile contribution to the cybersecurity community. By employing a normalized Halstead complexity metric to measure source code complexity of clean benign repositories compared to that of crypto miners, we discovered that the complexity is significantly and measurably higher in the miners than in the non-miners, which is shown in the box and whisker plot on the right. We believe that this knowledge can be leveraged as a code review technique to prevent malicious crypto mining injections into open source repositories. Next slide, please. Sorry. Oh. One more slide before we get too much further. Here's an overview of what we'll be covering today. Essentially, we'll be discussing why we chose to do this, how we did it, what we saw, and what it all means. So that is to say the motivation to why we chose crypto mining, uh, injections, the metric selected, influencing how we did it, so why we chose normalized house complexity, and the methods, results, and analysis, which will tell us what this all means and what we found. Next slide, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Anshika, and I'm a junior here at UMBC. So over the years, there has been steady growth in usage of cryptocurrency. More and more people are being attracted to the idea of this new form of currency and starting to mine them. Some people casually mine them, some people um, using their home devices. However, there are some who illegally inject malicious crypto mining code on other people's devices. Take the example of this burning Android. A malicious crypto mining code has rendered this device useless. Um, next slide, please. So what makes matter worse is that crypto mining code are open source. So almost anyone can access a malicious crypto mining code and conduct a supply chain attack. However, it being open source also means that we can analyze and detect this code using software repository mining techniques. Next slide, please. So one of the best places to start this analysis is on GitHub. GitHub is home to thousands of repositories, so it can provide a good sample set. For our research, we have conducted two types of analysis on both non-mining and mining repositories. The first type of analysis uh, we performed was static code analysis, where we looked at source codes, maintainability, complexity, and entropy. For the second type of analysis, we looked at things like commit patterns and the size of the project. Next slide, please. Hello, uh, my name's Ben. Um, and so we introduced our um, new and significant contribution here, which is normalized Halstead difficulty. So now um, tying it all together where we start with this idea of there's code that exists on the web, we can find it. We know that it can mine on people's computers, but now we want to look at kind of programmatically detecting it in a novel way, something that might be useful as a code review technique one day. So what we um what we what we went out there to search for was things that are characteristics of all code, a feature that we could track and possibly modify it in a way that can indicate the character of code in, and possibly show a change or a difference that is in mining code sources. And what we see is that Halstead difficulty was a good place to start. Um, it was mentioned this is a 40-year-old metric. This is something that was really more important probably in research during the 80s. 
until people showed that Halstead difficulty on its own has a really strong correlation with the source lines of code of a function. So when we calculate this Halstead difficulty, where we're taking distinct operators and total operands, and we're calculating a metric that's based off how complex the interactions between those two are. So if we look at that HD equals function down there, what, what that equation shows is something that has more total operands, meaning distinct operands are being used multiple times. So we don't just have A equals five. We have A equals five, and then A equals itself times two, and then it equals itself uh, multiplied by its logarithm of you know some base. We have this complicated usage of the same variables over and over again that throws the Halstead difficulty higher. And it's correlated with the lines of code of the function, which makes sense. Because if a function's longer, we expect more of these operations. But what we thought is it's possible that mining code doesn't want to look like mining code. Perhaps it's obfuscated, or perhaps it's not obfuscated, and it's simply been copy-pasted several times to the point where people are doing things with the libraries they don't need to do. And this would make the usage of the same variables over and over again. It, they might have poor naming techniques in such a way that our variables are reused in a bad maintenance pattern, and our Halstead difficulty goes up. How do we differentiate that from a normal function by its lines of code? We could create a density. We could normalize it. And this is where our, uh, this is not that our member Elias came up with. What if we divide the Halstead difficulty of a function by its lines of code? These two things that 40 years ago were thought to be very closely correlated, what if we could show that there's actually a deviation there and some functions are short but still difficult? And that could be a red flag. Perhaps it could be a green flag. We'll show you what we found, but this is, um, this is our metric that we really want to contribute. This is um, something new. So to get to get kicked off, what we do is we take the we, we selected 100 non mining repositories, we selected 75 mining repositories, all of these are primarily um, their JavaScript projects meant to run in browser. So your Node.js projects, your assets of other GUIs that are not on the web, they're not included here. These are um, these are browser based projects. They're popular projects, too, especially for the non miners. For the non-miners, we were able to find things that are starred high, that have lots of con contributors, that have lots of um, interaction. For the mining, we were a little less picky. We needed things that could do any cryptocurrency mining, any mining platform, as long as it's on a browser. So we collect these, and we have some baseline statistics for them here on this slide. We didn't really think of the size of them. We thought that we need to take everything because we don't want to show a false correlation between size and complexity. We want to show that this complexity is general. Um, and we, we, we calculate these, uh, these mean normalized Halsteads over here on the, those graphs on the right. So our Halstead data points, which are normalized. So this graph shows normalized. Um, you also notice that for the minor, we're taking from the, the Halstead data points and that one on the logarithmic scale. So these things are going up logarithmically, and we can see minors, it ends all the way at 10 to the fifth, while the non-minors are ending somewhere near 10 to, the, 10 to the 10 squared, maybe around 160 on that scale, or actually closer to 500 pieces logarithmic, while the uh, minors are all the way to 10 to the fifth, much larger number. So this was the point where after all the figures we looked at this was when we said normalized halstead is what we want to continue with this seems promising it's what we want to show this semester so, um, so let's dig a little bit deeper um so we, we we have a statistical hypothesis here and this is that the essentially that these populations are different we can differentiate them between you know the miners and the non-miners by using the normalized Halstead value. We perform a t-test. We're able to do this mainly because the size of our samples and the fact that we were able to see that the variances were unequal. So I'll point back to this slide just to show that um, you know the the populations really are different in terms of um, the Halstead. So we knew we could meet the criteria of a t-test, and then um, you know cut into there and I'll, I'll let Elias take the rest of this um talk about statistics since this is sort of his um 
the, his area as a statistics major. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Elias Enamorado. Thank you, Ben. Um, so yeah, once we collected the data from the minor repositories versus the non-minor repositories, um, we first had to come up with our statistical hypothesis um, to see if uh, mining is really different than non-mining. Um, I All my work was uh, double-checked by Dr. Kiefle uh, from UMBC. Um, so our hypothesis is, are the mean values for the mining normalized Helstead uh, value the same as the non-mining. So is mu equal to mu? Are they the same thing? Is there no difference? Is there a difference? And to check, to, uh, to get a proper statistical test, um, we had to analyze what we have. Um, we have sample sizes greater than 30. Um, the variances are unequal, but thanks to our sample sizes being independent, continuous, and being a lot greater than 30, um, under Dr. Kiefer's uh, guidance, we performed a two-sample t-test to perform this statistical uh, hypothesis. I will leave it to Ben for the next slide to explain our results. <clears throat> So once we did our statistical test, um, we really, we did confirm the different um, complexity pattern and that these uh, these um, populations really are um, different. Now, on this graph here, this is an abstraction of what we looked at earlier. And I'll show another abstraction of it too, as the box and whisker, since this is really the, the significant um, data that we generated based off Halstead. And, um, there's some there's some interesting things in our results that pose some other challenges for us that are um, worth discussing here, which is one, you may notice on this uh, frequency graph that the frequency in occurrences in repositories, nearly 40 non-mining repositories actually returned a mean of close to zero for their Halstead difficulty. And this was um this was a uh, this was kind of shocking that a lot of these web projects aren't really returning Halstead difficulties at all. And this was mainly because of the structure of their projects where their JavaScript code was not necessarily formatted as we thought. Some of their code may have been included in different ways. It could have been TypeScript files. They could have been different kinds of, um, you know, web components, things that really our parsing wasn't, um, things that we weren't, we're ready for. And then in the mining, you see there's also a subset that's there in that zero range. We did not throw the zeros out in our research. We kept them because we believe that is representative of web projects based off the way, you know, we, we parsed web projects. So there is going to be that, um, that, that challenge of some repositories just aren't structured in a way that's easy to calculate the Halstead difficulty. They're using code in templates, such as a Vue.js project or something that something that's destined for the web, that's compiled for the web, but maybe isn't already a distributable web version as we would face in the wild. So this was um, this was something we observed as a um, as a real kind of um, challenge at this level. Now, another point we make is that. The thing that makes a mining program run is more likely to be the thing that's absent in the non-miner than something they have in common. This is um, this is more of a hunch, and there's a reason that we don't. Um, there's a reason we don't prioritize this earlier in the presentation, but we feel it's necessary to share um, and also discuss this as an open problem. Something we'd like to explore as another result in the future. We really do see that um, if we were to do an insertion test of inserting code into another one, which we'll talk about in our discussion, we did do a preliminary test. We believe that we could show that the difficulty would go higher because of the part of the miners that is so complicated is the thing that makes them miners. It's not the main functions. It's not the general JavaScript operations. If we were to insert it, we would see the difficulty go up higher than the non-miners. Um, and on that, let's come back to the box and whisker plot and kind of um, conclude our analysis of this stage of our research, um, which is an abstraction of these graphs again, that the miners, even the mean of the miners is higher than 
that thor that that third quartile for the non-miners in terms of where the normalized Halstead difficulty stands, which means in on average the mining repository is completely out of the range of non-miners if you just exclude a few outliers that were really unique when we looked at them further. So we think that um, if somebody were to make a contribution putting a whole miner program into a non-mining repository such that it would find its way onto someone's browser via a supply chain attack, meaning somebody contributes a project in and a commit in some hot fix in GitHub, and then this program is eventually put through the CICD pop, uh, pipeline all the way to the point that somebody downloads what they think is a benign program as part of the source of an HTML page. They actually end up with a crypto miner running on their browser. Um, we think that we could catch something like that using complexity. We think it would have some errors, but we think it's still a worthwhile um, code review technique despite these um, false positives that could return in that case that something is a minor and it's below the range and something is a non-minor with a um, outlier in that case. But we really do, um, we do think that we could catch the bad actor when they try to inject this code. Um, I'll, I'll, th I'll give this back to Elias now to talk about um, that insertion test that we ran um, during our research. So to test our results to see if we can actually catch a supply chain attack, um, we selected 20 random repositories and a non-mining repository um, out of random from the 100 that we had. Uh, I put them in a zip file and I sent them over to Ben and I asked him, um, here is this uh, virus, I, uh, here is this malicious uh, file. Um, I don't know the health the complexity of it. Um, put it in any two of the random of the 20 uh, files and then send it back to me. Don't tell me uh, which ones you put them in. I will run my tool against them and see if I'm able to know when and where, not when, I'm sorry, where you place uh, these files. And uh, we are proud to say we're, uh, I was uh, successful in detecting in the repos and the specific files in which uh, ben placed the, the malicious file. Um, so as you can see down in the screen below, you have uh, the normalized health set difficulty of that repo, which is 2.4, and then you have the standard deviation. So it deviated from uh, minus four plus four. And then my, uh, and then the tool down below, it says, all right, there's these function calls that are in countable and countable.min.js file that they have a health scale difficulty of 26. Now the normalized, uh, the average for the whole repo is two, but here you have this file, which is at 26. That's something that requires further investigation. And it didn't only bring up one, but two functions that really were outliers there. And after analyzing the data, I was able, uh, after analyzing the results, I apologize, um, I could see, hey, there's something funny going on here. And I was able to dig deeper and see that he did uh, inject them in Countable. But he, he used different names at the moment, but this is just a screenshot of my code running in general. Then I will switch to uh, Naomi for the open problem. I think Ben, you actually going to discuss one of these. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I'll take the first open problem here. So, um, you know, if if you saw what Elias just presented with that insertion test, and um, I I I, you know, I've enjoyed this research, and I thought that was a pretty exciting moment for us, and it showed that you know we do have this could be really valuable as part of a pipeline, you know, in GitHub when you're developing in a team and you just want to have that extra, you know, programmatic analysis of your code that can show, you know, we, we've got something that's out of the normal complexity of things that people do with this project. We want, we want uh, more people to be on this reviewer list of this commit and we want to give it another look. And, you know, we, we see that as something that's exciting about this work where it could be an automated code review process. Um, we don't have a deliverable, um, you know, plugin for GitHub or some kind of CI/CD module. 
but we, we consider this really something that uh, could be of value. And we may even be able to find that Halstead difficulty just shows when things are out of the ordinary in general, and maybe it's going to catch other kinds of malware outside of crypto mining. It's going to catch any side of any kind of insertion that is really haphazard, that's very complex, and shows the signs of it's something that wasn't maintained well, or it's something that someone doesn't want you to maintain, which is a, is a red flag in any software engineering project. Yep. And another open problem surrounds adding more metrics to make our model better and more accurate. Um, like we saw in some of the graphics, there is sometimes some overlap between the miners and the non-miners. Um, so we can't always conclusively tell if something is malicious based solely on the complexity. Um, so we would like to add more, possibly like the character line density like that is shown in the third bullet, or some other metrics that can make our model more accurate. We think that that's a pretty nice open problem. Next slide. Okay, so we will briefly go over a poster and then take some questions. Um, as you can tell, our poster was not exactly designed to be viewed at this size. So um, Ben is going to put a link, and he just put it there um, with a PDF. So if you'd like to zoom in um, for any specific parts, you can see it. And otherwise, Ben, you want to get started? Of course. So this um, this is our poster. We really thought about what are the what are the most what's the best way we could advertise our paper and you know get someone excited about this research too. And um, well, I suppose the first thing we thought was you know it's got a good motivation. So everybody uses a browser. Anybody can be crypto jacked on their browser. So we want to um, we want to focus on that accessibility that's out there now. And, you know, cryptocurrency, it's a big topic. If anybody's seen Bitcoin right now, it's up to 23 grand again. So we're also going to see a boost of crypto mining on browsers. It's it's going to be in the news as well. Uh, you can say you heard it here first. Um, and th there's just a big need for it right now. So reviewing code to present to prevent these sort of attacks as more people are using platforms like GitHub and developing in the open source using that Bazaar model we mentioned earlier where people develop like it's in a public marketplace and um, code is out there, people can contribute, people can um, you know make suggestions, open issues, and that can lead to this um, it can lead to a very secure repository where a large group of people review or it can lead to a very insecure repository where few are reviewing and many are contributing. So we want to add that automatic reviewer to build the review team. This is really what we want our end um, influence to be here, to say that code review is valuable and that even automated processes can, um, can go a long way in catching things that are suspicious. Um, so that this is where our this is where our method begins. We pick up the repositories, we filtered out the non-JavaScript source code and assets generate our figures and then showed that we had um we had some differences in the populations so i will um i'll return back to naomi to um cover the rest of our poster and what we chose to put on it yeah okay so some of these graphics are really important we felt that they were like probably the best advertisement for our poster um for our uh, paper um the box and visco plot is just a very effective uh depiction of what the house debt complexity looks like in the, the glaring difference in the miners versus the non-miners like the third quartile in the miners is just so much higher um, than in the non-miners um, and then in the analysis and conclusion we see that so many of the repositories are of the non-mining repositories most of them their complexity is is you know a lot lower um which was something to note for us that we thought was important. Um, yeah, and we just we think that all of this research together can be combined possibly with some you know further development to really make a difference in the code review process for open source repositories. Um, we'd also really like to thank our technical directors, uh, Matthew Alder and Bill Coulter, whose guidance was invaluable to this process. And Dr. Sherman, whose detailed feedback was just so incredibly helpful just looking at our original paper and where we are now is you know it, it's pretty impressive um also to dr nicholas and dr 
uh, Kifle, who um, helped us tremendously with the statistics and the entropy um, discussions. So with that, are there any questions either on the poster or the paper or presentation? Um, I have a question now, maybe this is Maxim. Okay. Hey, uh, this was a great, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I have a, I have two questions that are kind of joint. Um, so you guys mentioned that you chose uh, repositories on GitHub for to compare the mining ones, right? Mm -hmm. Were there any considerations when you were choosing that hundred uh, code repositories? Yeah, so we wanted to choose stuff that were popular and well maintained. So our um, in terms of actual numbers for that, we chose only repositories that had at least a thousand stars on GitHub um, that had been modified or had emerged to master within the past year um, and had a, a lot of JavaScript files so that we knew that we had, you know, a, our tool is built to analyze JavaScript files. So we chose stuff that only had 50% or more of the files were uh, JavaScript. So given um, so given that you guys chose the repository that way, did you ever get a chance to you know look at why there was actually a, this difference that you guys were able to find between the code repositories that you chose, given you know there could be some style of code there, and then the mining code? Yeah. Um, so I guess the this project was kind of focused on the open source community and specifically the open source community that has a lot of contributions. So we kind of felt that our, our the repositories we chose were a good sampling of those popular open source repositories, which tend to probably follow those, those standards of um, less complex code. So we felt that it was a, a fair comparison to compare that against the miners. But it's, I mean, it, it would be interesting to run it against a less well-maintained and see what happens. But for this project, we didn't focus on that. And, and into some reasons about why, well, well, we can move to the next question, actually. Um, but uh, I do, we do have some more thoughts on that, too, in our paper. So, um, you know, please feel free to read our paper when we're, um, when we've released it. Are there, are there any more questions? And I have a question. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Uh, this is Jimmy. First off, this is a great presentation. I was able to follow up all the way through. And um, I just have a question about, do you have any recommendations if we suspect one of our devices have fell into clip jacking? Like what are the like, uh, obvious indicators? Yeah, um, so the clearest indicator is somebody who wants to use your computer to mine they're going to use as much cpu as they can until you catch them so if they're if they're really smart and using statistics on their side they might set a limit where they only want to use 10 percent of your cpu so you're very unlikely to notice however we notice with browsers that's not normally the case because you may only use the site for a short time they want to use all of your cpu that they can in that time so when your fans kick on and you see your cpu usage has gone through the roof Normally, that means somebody's running a crypto miner through your machine, and they want to take advantage of every second they have your computer for. Another thing is, um, you know, if you use things, there's wonderful browser extensions that actually block a lot of links and networks that um, someone would do a mining pool access on. So, so wherever somebody would mine on a large mining pool, contributing their efforts of crypto mining with a ton of clickjacked computers. We have large lists of those um, those um, networks and domain names, and um, there's some pretty effective blockers out there for dynamic browser um, catching of these things. I would also look for like poor battery performance. So like it drains your battery really quickly. That could indicate that something suspicious is going on in the background. Yeah, so like if you have one Chrome tab open and nothing else and your device is overheating and it's not my old laptop, then there's probably something uh, nefarious um, to at least inspect and see what, what else is running on your computer. Yeah, you don't want to have a burning Android phone like our motivation picture. 
Thank you. That all makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'll definitely check out some. You said Chrome extensions that prevents uh, click jacking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some great open source ones out there that just have a list of networks to block connections to, and that that's probably the strongest way to do this. Okay, great, great job. Very interesting, clear, significant uh, contribution. So thanks a lot. And we'll now move on to the second presentation about a educational security game called Meeting Mayhem. You good, Trent? Hello. Hello. All right, can everyone hear us? Wait, yes. no, I don't want to share screen. I want to share application. I do this. Share content. All right, Trent. Well, it seems it doesn't want to let me share. So how about you do? <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, just one second, everybody. Let me get my uh, stuff shared. I'll try to reload. Maybe that'll help. I'll be back. Uh, can everybody see my screen? I can see it. Yep. Great. Thank you. All right, Richard, you ready? Test, test, test. Richard. Richard. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? You're, are okay. you ready? Yeah. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Trenton Foster. My partner is Richard Baldwin. And we are going to be talking about a game that we made. So... <clears throat> What exactly is Meeting Mayhem? Um, well, first off, it's the game that we made, or are making, I should say. Um, and its goal is to, to teach adversarial thinking through the Dole of Yao model, which we'll get to a little bit later. It's a web-based game for around three to five players. Uh, and all the users in the game uh, have a goal, that is to s arrange a meeting time and a place through an insecure network in which the adversary uh, is in control of. Um, next slide. So the way that we're teaching adversarial thinking is through the Dole of Yao security model. And the reason that we picked this is because it is a very abstract way at doing network security. So when an agent sends a message through the network, you don't have to worry about the message failing. No packets will be lost. Uh, every message sent is uh, able to be received. And when cryptography is pre uh, performed, it's not able to be hacked. So you don't have to worry about the security of your cryptography uh, or anything being broken. So these constraints make it very easy to test a protocol, um, which is what this is aimed to do at the end of the day. Uh, so it really lets you see if a protocol works or if it doesn't work. Um, and we'll get into what the network adversary can actually do to messages, um, but there's actually quite a bit it can do and it makes it a very, very hard challenge. So a little bit of the inner workings of the game, there's a number of roles in which each player can pick. So Richard mentioned that you know, you'd have two to five-ish players um, and then a network adversary. So let's say you had two people playing uh, and then a third person playing the network adversary. Well, you'd have two users um, and these are just the people passing messages back and forth, trying to make that time and place to meet at. Uh, then that third person would be the network adversary who is in opposition to the, the users. So this network adversary is trying to stop them. Um, if anybody else you know, wanted to spectate, so this, is, this can be and was uh, in a previous iteration used in a classroom setting. So let's say it was three people doing it or five people or seven. Uh, anyone else could be a spectator um, and they'd be able to see the messages passed from user to user whereas typically a user only gets to see their messages sent and received. And then you'll notice the game master user. And this is like a sub role. So the, sub, the game master could be a user or a spectator, um, but it, it's typically the network adversary and you'll see why later. But the game master is able to change the game state at will. So they're able to revert the game to a previous part. They're able to add in layers, uh, which we'll talk about to the game. And this is really where the learning comes in because while the users will learn from experience um, and they'll learn from their mistakes uh, very easily, the game master is what enables the speed at which they learn and the effectiveness of, of how they learn. So you'll see that the users get a few tools that they can use to send messages. 
you'll see they're, they're able to encrypt their messages, hash their messages, sign their messages. And these are things that are not initially available to them. The game master is going to, uh, when they deem necessary, enable the users to do this. Um, the network adversary, of course, is able to do a number of things. It can do anything the user can. It can edit messages. It can spice messages. Uh, it can you know, infect users. Uh, it can do quite a bit. And you'll see soon that the network is just incredibly powerful. So here's a very, very basic way of how the game could go. Because it is very open, you know, there's there's a million and one ways to actually play the game. Uh, for this example, Alice and Bob are trying to meet up at a time and at a place. So Alice will suggest a time and place, Taco Bell at 6, uh, and send that message through the network. Now the network adversary will see that message and instead change it to Burger King at 9 o'clock. That way, the network adversary can get them to meet at a place that it wants them to meet at. So it'll then pass this message through the network to Bob, and Bob will see this message, I'd like to meet behind the Burger King parking lot at 9 o'clock, and Bob will think that message is from Alice, because all he sees is the message came from the network, and it appeared to come from Alice. So Bob will send a confirmation, the network adversary will then forward their own confirmation to Alice, and suddenly Alice and Bob were in the wrong place at the wrong time. So this is how meeting mayhem generally flows. Uh, uh, each round generally has condition win conditions for the user. For example, if uh, they only had access to encryption, it, uh, a win condition could be to successfully send a pre-shared key through the network to another person. Um, and it depends on, on what they have or what the goals uh, of the game master are. Uh, the game generally lasts three to seven rounds. Uh, it starts off with discussion. Um, that could be about the previous round or the next round, what's to come. After that, it's the user's turn. The users craft uh, and make their messages, and then we'll send them out to the network adversary, who will then receive them, modify them or not if they don't want to, uh, and forward them on. And optionally, the game master can enable more features if they so choose, or they could keep it the, the same and you have multiple cycles. Next slide. Um, so where did this idea come from? Uh, it came from a game called the Protocol Analysis Game created by Anna Skoloszewski. Um, this game was originally written, uh, made, for pen <clears throat> made for use in a pen with pen and paper. After COVID uh, started, Anna's had created a version designed to work on over text. The game is designed to help students understand the Dole of Yao model, as well as uh, prepare them for doing protocol analysis using the CPSA or Cryptographic Protocol Shapes Analyzer tool. Um, and it works really, really well for that. Um, the motivation we had is to fix some of the issues that were in both of those versions and make it more accessible to the general populace. Next slide. So we're going to go through a real game that we'd played. Um, this is the remote adaptation that Ellis had created. Um, <clears throat> on the right, you have all the messages. The adversary, Necrit adversary's messages are highlighted in red. This first round has no tools. Um, it's between me and Trent. I'm sending a message to Trent through the network of Hello World. The network adversary just modifies that message to say meet at 11 p.m. in the parking lot. Trent, not knowing uh, or being able to really tell anything else, assumes that this is actually from me and says it looks good. And the network adversary then forwards that message to me. Next slide. So <clears throat> this is round two. Same thing, no tools between Jeff and Josh. Um, Jeff decides to send a message of a time and place to meet, 3.30 at the office. And just like last time, the network adversary has changed it, and it all falls apart from there. Next slide. So what went wrong? 
pretty much everything. Uh, there's not a lot the users could do, but there's not really, that's not the reason why this part exists. This part exists to really drive home the fact that you're sending your message through a hostile environment that doesn't want whatever you want to happen, wants their own thing to happen. <clears throat> and so it's more to kind of set the stage for what's to come. Next slide. So this is round three. Now the Game Master has enabled encryption. And again, we're looking on the right side. <clears throat> if you notice next to Charlie, uh, so this is Fiona sending to Charlie, there's an E and then a message in parentheses. The way this is set up is the E means it's encrypted. The message is what's being encrypted. And the after the comma is the key that's used to encrypt this message. So Fiona is sending a message to Charlie. She's in encrypting meet at McDonald's at 10 a.m. Uh, with Charlie's public key. The network adversary receives this. Because cryptog cryptography is assumed to be perfect, the network, can't, the network adversary cannot actually open up this. But what he can do is just toss it and make a new one, uh, because he also has access to Charlie's public key. And just like last time, it didn't work very well. Next slide. Uh, this is continuing on with it only having encryption enabled. This is Hannah to Ian. Uh, Hannah decided she wants to meet everyone at the parking lot at 11 o'clock at night. And the network adversary obliged this message. It is not encrypted. Um, Ian, not exactly being sure what's happening, decides to send a message. Checking and making sure it's actually... Uh, she. She actually knows what's. He actually knows who it is, um, and he's doing something a little bit different. He's encrypting this message with his the message itself with Ian's private key as well as Hannah's public key, and this is an attempt to make a digital signature just using encryption. Um, but the adversary just gets rid of it, and it doesn't work. So next slide. So what went wrong with this one? <clears throat> First off, everyone has, a has access to all public keys, including the network adversary. So you can't rely on just encrypting with one key. Second, the network adversary can drop packets, uh, the packet content and send off whatever it wants. So it's a lot harder than it looks. Next slide. Uh, here's some more with encryption enabled. Um, this section is between Bob and Alice, and Bob and Alice are trying to set up a, uh, suggest setting up a sort of protocol. Um, Bob says, let's agree on a shared message first. Uh, network, the network adversary forwards it on. Alice agrees, the network adversary forwards it on. And Bob says that he's going to sign it with his key and she will do the same and to meet at the library at 3 p.m. Next slide. Now the adversary just gets rid of it and says, hey, we need to meet at the parking lot at 11 o'clock. Uh, and Alice, not actually having ever received the protocol that Bob had created, just agrees and says, all right, are you sure? Okay. Um, and the network adversary then forwards the same thing to Bob, but Bob, having known the protocol that he had created, refuses. This is demonstrating the importance of having a protocol beforehand and not trying to uh, create it on the network. Next slide. So at this point, I uh, had decided to create a very, very basic protocol. There were a couple things I wanted to do. First, I wanted to sh set a pre-shared key. Um, so this is a symmetric key that everyone has, all the valid participants. Um, and also a kind of way to see if there's any weirdness going on. So if you receive a message that is not encrypted with this key, to forward it back to that person so they know something weird's going on. And that's to just see what's happening. Next slide. So now we're on to round six. And <clears throat> throughout everything, we are encrypting with that gigantic key that says Discord light theme is better than dark theme. Um, the network adversary does not have access to this key. So 
he's going to receive this message and forward on to uh, from Fiona to from Alice to Fiona, and then Fiona is going to respond. And the network adversary is going to do something a little bit different. He's actually going to take the body of Alice's message and just return it to Alice. Next slide. Not only that, the network adversary is going to take Fiona's message and send it off to Richard. And Richard is going to respond uh, as anyone else would. And he doesn't know anything's wrong and just assumes that's the start of a conversation and continue on with it. Uh, and the network adversary is going to forward this response to Alice. And he's just kind of shifting these packets around. Next slide. So what went wrong? The main issue that we had is that identities could not be verified. Uh, we had, we may have been able to communicate and the network adversary couldn't use it. We may have had a way to see if there's any weirdness going on, but we had no idea who was who. Uh, and the network adversary could also send multiple um, packets with the same body to different people. Next slide. All right, here's where it gets fun. This is round seven, the last round that we played. Uh, this first bit is Hannah talking to Jeff, and she's trying to meet at the dining hall uh, <clears throat> at 12 o'clock. Just like last time, we still have encryption. We still have a pre-shared key. Everything else is the same. Um, however, signing digital signatures are also enabled. And so not only is she sending it with the pre-shared key, she's also signing it to make sure people know who this is from. The network adversary goes and forwards it on, um, but also decides to forward it to Charlie. Jeff responds to Charlie, um, just checking if this whole thing works for him, uh, and kind of spreading and making it so everyone meets at the dining hall at noon. Next slide. Charlie has an interesting response. He responds to Hannah with, I can only meet at 11 o'clock at the parking lot. And he is using all the conventions that were established. The network adversary then takes Jeff's message and forwards it to Charlie and takes Charlie's message that he just sent to Hannah and forwards it to Jeff. Jeff receives that message, assuming it works. Everyone, uh, it's all the conventions were were correct and just this and goes with it after that the network adversary is sending the sure that works for me forwarding it back to charlie next slide here's where it gets fun the network adversary then takes the message of meeting at 11 o'clock in the parking lot and forwards it to all the other participants um it's not going well next slide So Bob, again, everything worked out, says that's fine. Uh, same with Charlie and Ed as well. And finally, the network adver or almost finally, the network adversary forwards uh, a confirmation from Ed. Next slide, or from Bob, as well as forwards Charlie's and Jess con confirmation. Finally, Josh responds and says he can't make it, you know, being responsible, social, distan social distancing, and the network adversary forwards that on. Next slide. So what went wrong? First, uh, like the previous round, the network adversary can send messages to multiple people. And the main thing that happened is the network adversary can also co-opt a user. Not all users are trustworthy. Um, so he, the network adversary, had co-opted Charlie, and Charlie had torn all, everything apart just because he was not working in with in good faith. Next slide. So that was an example of the text-based adaptation of the protocol analysis game. There's a few problems with both versions. With the pen and ver paper version, first problem is it's easily cluttered and it's not very expandable. Um, it gets very messy, lots of papers all over the place, and it's kind of hard to run a lot of groups at the same time just because it's a very personal affair. Um, text-based adaptation, as you saw, it it's kind of clunky. It took me a while to figure out what exactly had happened when I looked at this again. And 
I'm sure you can all agree that it's kind of hard to read exactly what's going on uh, in each of those messages. Next slide. And this is why the protocol analysis game is amazing. It's really, really fun to play. It educates uh, its, uh, the Dolevial model and adversarial thinking very effectively. Uh, it teaches real-time adversarial thinking. It can be very beginner friendly, at least for the pen and paper version. And it illustrates the difficulty in building secure protocols. Next slide. So, Meeting Mayhem is an adaptation of this protocol analysis game. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make a version that removes the clutter, um, getting rid of all those messages and all the paper and all that jazz, increases expandability. We're using Docker, so this can be easily distributed and spun up on different machines. So it's not so limited to just one group um, at a time. We're also trying to streamline game flow. So instead of manually writing a message and handing it over, you can you just click a few buttons and you're good. As well as easier, an easy, having an easier time reviewing what it actually happened. So as the game goes on, everything that happens in the game is archived. And so when the game is over and we and the group comes together and looks at the what had happened, we can show exactly what had happened, talk about, like I did here, what went wrong, why it happened, etc. Next slide. So here is a look at what the user view actually looks like for the game. So at the top, you'll see a number of tabs. Home is just going to be where you send the messages. I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, you'll see sent messages, which will show you a backlog of every message that you sent, and received messages, which will show you a backlog of every message that you've received. Now, the Actions tab will let you do a number of actions, including sending that message that you've written, nesting it uh, for purposes of encryption, or creating a systematic key. So under Message in the middle, you're going to see a number of drop-down boxes. Now, these boxes all correspond to the, the fields that can be within the message. So you'll choose a sender, you'll choose a recipient, you'll choose a time, you'll choose a place. These all have pre-filled values that you can pick from. Um, which aren't necessarily what you have to use, but they're easy to use and we recommend that you know users use them. Um, and you'll see the encryption box is just a checkbox um, because like we said, this model is very symbolic. So encrypting the message isn't something you have to do yourself, which is part of what makes it beginner friendly. Now it's important to note that this encryption box and the key dropdown are not gonna initially be available um, because since the game is focused around self-propelled learning and the game master uh, enabling those features, uh, those will be there as they go. So the reference box below is a handy feature which lets you pick a message from the received backlog to view as you do your next message. So you don't have to flip between the tabs just to review what was sent to you. Uh, here was an early mockup of what we used to have um, for our views. So you'll see the user view is a lot less intuitive. All it has is typing a message. There's no guidance. There's no backlogs. Uh, the network view gave you a very simple view of to and from. Uh, the, the main thing that you'll see here that wasn't present is the Game Master control panel. Um, and that's something that's still in the works of letting you control the game flow, whether that's pausing, reverting, resetting, um, as well as enabling and possibly even disabling those features that we've been talking about, like encryption. So a number of things separate this from the pen and paper version or the text-based version. Um, for instance, we're able to add colors, we're able to add uh, different user elements like those drop-down boxes, and we can just get rid of uh, you know, a bunch of envelopes, paper, pens, a bunch of things that we don't necessarily need for the game. Um, and we're also given the chance to do auditory elements so, you know, for instance, winning is supposed to give you a good feeling, right? And that's going to be reinforced by, you know, a pleasant little copyright-free victory chime. Um, getting a message sent or received to you, you know, will have a very classic, you know, inbox sound of doo-doo, you know, received message, um, as well as very small haptic feedbacks for clicking the buttons on the screen um, that just get you more immersed in the game flow. So the things that are finished at this point are the user generation and login, and this is important because 
you'll have a number of people logging into this Docker site that we've spun up. And it'll give you a number of you know users. You, you'll, you'll say how many you want. It'll, it'll give you that many. Um, and all they have to do is just put in those login credentials that are preset uh, and then reset every time it's run, and they're good to go. Uh, the network adversary and the users have their corresponding views. Like you saw that user view earlier, the network adversary has a very similar one uh, that lets them send you know, to a greater extent using those tools from before. The internal database is working. You know, you The messages will go into the database um, which we can then use to revert back to with the game tools and display to the spectator view and all that. Uh, and that ties into the message transfers. The things that are left to finish is finalizing the spectator view, which will give you access to all of the messages sent and received. Um, the GM panel that we talked about, which will control the game view, the game flow, and everything in between. Uh, the connecting database, so right now, the, the functions that are working are not tied to the database yet. So the functions of uh, like the dropdown sends and all those. Uh, and then once those are all finished, we can begin testing with a live audience, you know, who will you know, catch things that we couldn't catch. And they will be able to provide us feedback on what they actually think about the game. So to recap, we talked about how Meeting Mayhem is going to teach adversarial thinking. Uh, why we chose the Dole of Yao model, uh, the different parts of the game, and what people can play as, what they need to do to win, how it looks like you know, to play an actual game, what the user interface looks like, what's done, what's left, and the benefits of creating this digital version. And we just want to extend a big thank you to everybody who's helped us along the way. Uh, Edward Ziegler, our technical director, who has used the game before in his class and is excited for this to be finished for use in his class. Um, Alan Sherman, who has been huge in all the feedback of our paper presentations and posters. Um, Ellen Goneski, who created the original game, a PhD student at UMBC. And then Mark Alano, a professor at UMBC and director of the game dev track, who's given us very in-depth feedback on the game aspect of things. and all the nitty gritty that we never would have thought of as people who've never made games before. Uh, and so here's our poster. Um, if you have any questions, let us know in just a minute as I'll walk you through what exactly this poster is. Uh, we just have very sample gameplay in the middle. You'll see Alice and Bob communicating with a sample message. On the right, you know, you'll see special thanks to the people who've helped us. You'll see the goal on the left of teaching adversarial thinking and emphasizing that it is free, it is online, it is open source through GitHub, and it is an educational game. There is an, a review of the Dole of Yao network model on the left, and then there is the goals of the players and the network adversaries at the bottom. Uh, thank you all for your time, and it has been a pleasure. Uh, any questions at this time? Can you full screen the end slide again? Yeah, forgot I was sharing. If um, people want to get involved with um, testing the game, um, uh, should they contact you? Yes. Yeah, uh, you can send me an email at richardbaldwin at umbc.edu, Richard Baldwin at umbc.edu, sent in chat, and just probably preface it with uh, Meeting Mayhem or something so I can pick it out of my inbox. Uh, I have a GitHub. I would need to dig it up, and I I can send it to you later, Maxim. Uh, the link to the GitHub. I don't think it's public right now, though. Yeah, um, it's currently private. What have you learned doing this project? Um, there's a lot more that goes into game design than I thought. Um, it's a lot more in depth than just making something that works. There's a lot of uh, considerations to make, like uh, for in in the user interface, what all the buttons do and what's what makes sense for someone who's never played it before. Um, 
uh, how to draw attention to certain things, etc. And in um, addition, and, even like winning the game was a big point of contention, whether there would be a winner or a loser. That's something we talked about for uh, a week or two. And how that would work. Like, what does winning actually mean in the context of this game? Obviously, you have uh, actually being able to arrange a meeting time and place, but in the example of the actual game that we played, no one ever actually managed to do that. And it's not exactly fun to play a game where you're constantly losing. And then for myself, I mean, Richard had played the game before starting the project, but I'd never even heard of the Dolo VI security model. So I was able to learn a lot about the model, about what it actually means, ways to do it, ways to not do it. And I thought it was very, very interesting. Um, so I have a question. What type of encryption algorithm are you using in the game? We're not using an encryption algorithm. Uh, there, This is all symbolic, as Trent had mentioned. Um, so when we click encryption, all that's mm -hmm. really happening is it's a check to see if the person has the key. And if they don't, it just shows some garbage message that's just randomly generated or maybe just a few stars or something. Um, we're not actually encrypting it. Encrypting it. It's just... It's just to symbolize what encryption does. Yeah, the Dolophy uh -huh. security model uh, assumes that your encryption is perfect. So there's no reason to you know, worry about what your encryption is. Naomi asks uh, if we use WebSockets. Um, we're using Flask as the web engine. So I haven't actually done anything with sockets within Python, which is the language you're coding in it. Flask is handling all of that for me, as well as like interfacing with SQL, using SQL Alchemy, et cetera. OK, thank you very much. Uh, good job. Um, we're, we plan to continue development of the game um, in the spring with the goal of having um, uh, written a paper and having a workable game. And if there are any students who want to get involved, in the evolution of the game, please contact me. Um, uh, I understand that uh, Akriti, who's our, our CDL webmaster, is going to get involved most likely. So Very now let's, let's move on to the third presentation, uh, uh, which is going to be formal analysis of the um, protocol, aka used in 5G. And this analysis will be done using the Dole of Yell adversarial model, which is why the game presentation came first. All right, can anyone not see the presentation? Can you guys hear me? Um, yes. Um, I okay. hope everyone's able to see the presentation. So, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are from the Cryptographic Protocol Analysis and Verification Group. So the main focus of our project was to actually conduct a formal method analysis of the 5G AKA protocol. We also conducted a formal analysis of the 4G EPS, aka protocol, mainly with the focus to find if the known issues in the 4G EPS, aka protocol, which are mainly the tracking of the subscriber issue, the man in the middle attack, the replay attack, and all of these known issues with the 4G were solved in the 5G, aka protocol, as claimed by the developers of 5G, aka. Uh, while we verified that all of the known issues of 4G EPS were solved in 5G uh, using the tool CPSA, uh, we did have some concerns with the 5G AKA protocol, which we will be talking about uh, further. So, next slide. So, we were three team members. I'm Pragya Bandari, a PhD student in computer science, uh, recently completed my master's. Uh, I had slight experience using this tool, CPS as well, to this research. 
Uh, Ryan and Jason, would you like to introduce themselves? Uh, hello, I'm Ryan, and I'm an undergraduate uh, studying computer science and mathematics. Uh, my main interests are in network security, cryptography. Hello, my name is Jason Schneck. I'm an undergraduate at UMBC studying computer science. I had no experience with CPSA and studied, learned a lot. Uh, I'm interested in learning more about protocols. Um, we would like to thank our technical director, Dr. Ed Ziegler, uh, who works at NSA and is also a faculty member here at UMBC. Uh, many thanks to our faculty advisor, Dr. Alan Sherman, who guided us through this research. Uh, next slide, please. So, after we discuss about the significant findings and the motivation of our project, uh, we'd like to talk about the authentication procedures of 4G uh, EPS AKA and 5G AKA. Now, both of these protocols actually use the AKA procedure, which is the authentication and key agreement procedure. But the 4G uses the evolved packet system, which is EPS uh, AKA authentication and key uh, proce uh, procedure. So what's the main difference between the two protocols? Uh, that's what we'll be discussing here. And then we'll talk about the tool that we've used for our protocol analysis, which is CPSA, uh, which is Cryptographic Protocol Shapes Analyzer. After that, we'd like to talk about some of the assumptions we made while uh, modeling our the two protocols, 4G and 5G. Uh, Basically, based on the you know due to the, the assumptions we had to make due to the limitations of the tool CPSA and some of the modeling decisions we took uh, to simplify the protocol. Uh, after that, we would like to analyze the shapes that were produced by the tool uh, based on our models and some interesting uh, shape actually caught our attention. And then we'd like to standardize with the outcomes of our research. Slide. So, as you can see on your slide, uh, on the left hand side, we have the 4G EPS AKA, and on the right hand side, we have the 5G AKA protocol. Essentially, both look almost the same. So, both of these protocols have three main components uh, the user equipment, which you can imagine it to be a mobile device, uh, a serving network, which you can imagine it to be a transmitter tower and a home network, which is the mobile operator like your Verizon or T-Mobile, etc. So in these diagrams, you can also observe that the channel between the UE, user equipment, and the serving network, uh, we have a dotted line over there. That's mainly to signify that this channel is not wired. It's not connected with wires. Uh, but on the other hand, the channel between the serving network and home network uh, is a wired connection which we have uh, shown as a solid line and highlighted in red. Now, we did verify that all of the issues with 4G were solved in 5G, but the 5G AKA documentation states that the channel between the serving network and the home network, as we have highlighted in red, is actually confidential and authentic. Though they do not say how exactly they are confidential and authentic. We're assuming that maybe because it's a wired connection, but being a wired connection, does that make it secure? Uh, there's also sequence numbers used in uh, 5G AKA to make sure that there's no replay attack in the sense that the messages are not replayed. So what sequence number actually does is it checks the freshness of a message. Though the home network does check, uh, so the user uh, home network checks for this uh, user equipment checks for the fresh uh, freshness of the message. The home network doesn't. So next slide, uh, Jason will be talking about the motivation. Hello guys. So the fifth generation wireless network was first introduced to the market in 2019 and is predicted to reach over 1.9 billion subscribers by the year 2024. The 5G networks are cellular networks that have more bandwidth than 4G. This gives faster download speeds. Due to this fact, the networks do not do, are not going to be exclusive just to cell phones. It will be more favorable to be used to give internet access to laptops, desktops, smartphones, Fitbits, and other Internet of Things devices. 5G is a faster, more reliable network than its predecessor, 4G. The 4G EPS AK and 5G AK protocol allows a subscriber and its service provider to, to establish a shared session key in authenticated fashion. It is 
its information is not transmitted in an authenticated fashion, an adversary may be able to access this key and compromise the data. This includes activity monitoring tax, which allows an adversary to, to leverage fake base stations and learn information about the target subscriber mobile device. An adversary can, can also use identi identity requests and IS, IMSI catching attack to track subscribers in certain geographical areas and can find a correlation between them and social identities. Therefore, the integrity of the protocol is very important to the privacy of users on the network. 5G communications follows an internet intellect ecosystem of intermingled devices, harvesting massive amounts of data that affect the way we interact with each other. So more banking, healthcare, credit card, and other private and public services are upgrading to this new mobile platform. As the world upgrades their networks to 5G, the more important it is to secure it from adversaries around the world. Next slide. To reinforce what was said by Prajna, the serving network and the home network entities of 4G and 5G are different. The basic functions are similar. The user equipment could be any device held by a subscriber, such as phones, laptops, Fitbits, and any other IoT device. The mobile management entity, MME, is the serving network for 4G. The security anchor function, SEEP, is the serving network for 5G. These are the cell towers of the model. The home, the home subscriber system, HSS, is the home network for 4G. The authenticated server function, AC, unified data management, UDM, authenticating credential repository and processing function, ARP, is the home network for 5G. These are the network data centers. One major difference between the 4G and 5G protocols is shown in the orange rectangles on the screen. In 4G, the MME creates an expected response vector and sends this along the protocol unencrypted. On 5G, is shown in the rectangle. The red rectangles, the AC creates an X-res and calculates a has response to send upstream, and this message is encrypted. Another thing to note is the purple trapezoid in the bottom right of the screen. This is add, this is add section in 5G compared to 4G. This added authentication gives more control to the home network. It validates if the user equipment and the server network have the same hash expected response that is initially sent. This section is the final step in authenticating a valid user equipment to the home network. As shown in the blue circles in the channel, between the server network and the home network, it's not specified how it is secure. Based on the documentation, it's said to be secure and confidential. This is because we assume the channel to be wired. But if you have physical access to the wire, you can still access the data being sent across the network. Next slide. Hello. So as we mentioned, uh, we use the cryptographic protocol Shapes Analyzer, also known as CPSA, to analyze both the 4G and 5G protocols. Um, so what is CPSA? Uh, it is a tool that was developed by MITRE um, that allows security professionals to define network protocols using strands-based theory. Uh, and what this means is that each entity on the network, uh, whether it's your cell phone or a server, uh, is represented as a strand that typically consists of sent and received messages. And CPSA will try to complete these strands using a Delevyao network intruder model, which we heard Renton, uh, Trent and Richard discuss previously, and it assumes that the adversary owns the network. Um, a couple limitations of CPSA include its analysis of hashing and encryption algorithms, uh, as well as its modeling of mathematical operations, which I'll get into in a little bit in a couple of slides. Um, on the right here, this is actually an example output from CPSA. Um, for, it's actually from their manual. Uh, and a couple things to note, you'll notice there are uh, black nodes, a blue node, and a red node. Uh, these black nodes are sent messages. Um, uh, the blue node is a realized node, which means that CPSA has determined how this message is being received. Uh, the red node is unrealized, meaning based on this visualization, CPSA doesn't, really, doesn't yet know how that message is being received. Uh, next slide. So on the right here is uh, some of the code we've used to model 5G AKA in CPSA. Um, don't worry, I'm not gonna actually walk through every line of code, but I would like to point out uh, a few, few of the more important modeling decisions we made. Um, first of all, uh, you'll notice that there are three roles, uh, the user equipment, serving network, and home network, and these roles are actually used to define the strands in CPSA. Um, also, these protocols rely heavily on uh, a shared secret between the user equipment and the home network. Uh, and so you can see in green there, we've actually modeled this shared secret as a uh, long-term key between the user and the home network. Uh, and we define it as non-originating, um, which tells CPSA that the adversary has no way of accessing um, this value. 
Uh, thirdly, um, the way the protocol talks about the channel between the serving network and the home network uh, implies that it's how it's defined is left largely up to uh, the service provider and how they want to implement it. Uh, so we've actually constructed two models. Uh, one provides confidentiality, which you see in blue there. We've provided confidentiality by using a symmetric encryption and encrypting the channel using like a shared key between the serving network and home network. Um, our other model actually removes this encryption and sees uh, what shapes we get when there is no confidentiality provided on that channel. Next slide. Um, so, as we discussed previously, uh, you know, one of the big limitations of CPSA is its modeling of mathematical operations. And you can see in the diagram on the right, there's actually quite a few mathematical functions and operations that are being um, done by the protocol. Uh, first of all, the green and the blue boxes there are message authentication and key derivation functions. And um, since and they pretty much take a random nonce and use that shared secret I was discussing previously, as input and derive values based on those. Um, and since the home network and the user are actually both uh, deriving these values, we've modeled them as hashes in CPSA. Uh, there's also an exclusive OR operation you can see in red there. And the home network is actually using this operation to uh, conceal the sequence number and send it to the user equipment. And since the user equipment actually has to extract the sequence number and use it to derive values, uh, we chose to model it as encryption. Um, also, one of the things, since, as I mentioned, CPSA doesn't uh, do analysis of its encryption and hashing. So by modeling these functionalities in this way, we're actually assuming that these exclusive operations and these functions um, don't have any flaws. And we're assuming that they're offering the necessary security. Next slide. Okay, so now uh, time to analyze some interesting shapes that we've got um, from the tool CPSA. So this first output shape is from the model. As Ryan mentioned, we have two models that we've modeled. One of the model is where uh, we've assumed that there's no security between the serving network and home network. Uh, basically, there's that no long-term key between them. So that's the case. Uh, these are the two shapes that we get for 4G and 5G, respectively. So the thing we need to uh, notice over here is that both of these shapes are realized shapes, which means that the protocol has run to completion. And both of these shapes are from the home network's point of view. So talking about the 4G shape, we can see that it says the home net from the home network's point of view, this protocol runs to completion uh, without having to authenticate the serving network or the user equipment essentially saying that the serving network or the user equipment could be anyone. Um, there could be a malicious serving network um, in, the, in, the, uh, um, in the network there, uh, which could um, act as a man in the middle. Um, it could uh, replay the messages between the home network and the user equipment, um, and essentially also uh, um, make it possible for the denial of service attack uh, in the network. In case of 5G, we can observe that the home network does authenticate the user equipment, but it does not authenticate the serving network whatsoever. In fact, we can notice that there's a dotted line between uh, the home network and the user equipment. So it essentially says that the user equipment uh, probably did not receive the exact message that was sent by the home network. So there could be a foul play by a malicious server network in between who is replaying the messages. Uh, it has access to all of the messages being passed between the two entities. And um, it could uh, have a, a demonstrate a replay attack uh, between them. Uh, next slide. So this is our second modeling, modeling assumption that we did. Uh, necessarily, we actually proposed kind of like a solution uh, to uh, the issue that what if there is no wired connection between channel between the serving network and home network? So if we do encrypt all of the messages with the shared long-term symmetric key, uh, all the messages that's passed between the serving network and home network, uh, these were the shapes that we got for 4G and 5G. So talking about the shape in 4G, as we can observe here, that from the home network's point of view again. The home network is authenticating the serving network, 
uh, but it's still not authenticating the user equipment. Actually, with 4G, this was the main known issue uh, that the user equipment is not getting authenticated whatsoever. Uh, this actually gives rise to uh, an attack called as Tau, which is a tracking area update attack. So what happens in this attack is that an attacker can basically track uh, the user equipment, which is your mobile device or any of the devices uh, that you're using, can track uh, to whichever area you move to. There's also this attack called IMSI caching attack. Uh, basically, it can uh, an attacker can keep track of your calls, your messages that you pass along the network. Uh, that's obviously not good. Uh, in case of 5G, we see that the home network is able to authenticate the serving network and the user equipment as we have highlighted with the green boxes. So the proposed solution of adding a long-term key definitely helps uh, the, to secure the 5G protocol. Next slide, please. So in this shape here, uh, we were messing around with modeling the sequence number in 5G. Uh, we did this by defining init roles that are initializing a, a randomized sequence number that's shared between the home network and the user. Um, and you'll notice in the shape here, there's actually two home init roles. Uh, one is initializing a sequence number for the user and one's initializing it for the home network. Uh, and this kind of shows us that the home network never actually checks the sequence number of the user. Um, and uh, I would like to point out, this doesn't actually indicate there is an attack on the protocol. In fact, it's still completing only when genuine uh, parties are involved. Uh, but it does raise concerns about the freshness of this initialization message boxed in green there. Um, and so the reason, uh, you may be wondering why I bring this up. Um, and the reason is, who cares about replaying this initialization message if it only completes successfully? Um, and the reason I mention is because there's, you can see here that KCF is actually being computed um, upon reception of this initialization message, which was required for earlier versions of the protocol in which it was sent immediately afterward. Although in an updated version of the protocol, KCF isn't actually sent until the final transmission there at the bottom, uh, but it's still being computed earlier on. And a fairly simple mitigation for this, I mean, would be to push down that computation to kind of help reduce the impact of denial of service attacks that involve replaying that initialization message. Next slide. We have analyzed the two protocols, 4G EPS AK and 5G AK protocol in the DOVL network intruder model. We were able to identify and verify the major structural weaknesses of the 4G EPS AK protocol. There's a lack of home network control. The home network cannot confirm if the protocol terminated successfully. We could not verify this led to any specific attack. Future work can identify if this is the case. One major structural fault in the 5G AK protocol we could find was that it assumes the channel between the server network and home network is secure because of the assumption that the channel is wired. If someone is able to connect to this wire, then it results in a major structural fault. The adversary can access personal identification of valid users on the system. This can lead to tracking and demand in the middle attacks on the network. We were able to successfully propose a solution to model the protocol in case the channel is not protected. We also observed a possibility of replay attack in the 5G protocol during the initialization of the authentication procedure. The 5G AKA protocol did not show any other major structural fault. The CPSA states produced do not explicitly talk about a possible attack. It only shows the structural faults of how there is a fault in the protocol. We hope with our research, we have been able to address the possible faults that can be avoided in future modification of the 4G EPS AKA and 5G AKA protocols. We've also created this poster. Uh, I can bring it up right here on the, I can't get this thing in the way. Uh, stop sharing all this and resharing. Here's the link. Search so this is a closer up view. You can also open up your in your own web browser. It's supposed to be a three foot, four foot by three foot poster. So it's not really meant to be shown on uh, uh, your computer screen Microsoft slide. 
as you can see, it looks like a CPSA shape produced. You pretty much just follow the protocol at the introduction or initialization node is black. It will send it blue nodes are received and it will continue down the protocol until our end result. As you can see, it highlights a lot of the different points we made throughout the presentation. Oops, not that percent. <laughs> and at this time, we would like to take any questions you would have. Um, can you comment on your experiences using CPSA? How hard was it to learn how to use the tool and uh, and and to carry out the work? Uh, I personally had no experience going into this project with CPSA. I've had experience with uh, list-based, uh, function-based programming before. Uh, the course, the 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 uh, what were they? The work sessions that Ennis ran actually helped a lot in learning and understanding how CPSA worked and the manual also. I wouldn't say I'm a master of it yet. Prajna and Ryan are a lot more adept at it than me. Yeah, I had some experience coming in from uh, a course I took with Dr. Ziegler last semester. Um, and Ennis's workshops definitely helped kind of advance that. and. Um, do some more advanced features that were needed for these protocols. In our protocol analysis lab, we've developed um, educational materials and a PhD student Ennis Goloshevsky will be um, in January making available these materials to anybody who wants to learn how to use CPSA. If you're interested, you can send me an email. Are there more questions? How about one more question? Someone. Do you think this pattern will continue with 6G? <laughs> <laughs> we hope not. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, another great job. Um, you know, very impressive, very professional, uh, great posters. Um, so thank you, everybody. And uh, for those interested in taking the Insure class, we'll offer it again in two years. Um, CDL Talks will resume uh, next semester, and I wish everybody uh, a nice winter break. You too, Professor. Happy holidays. This concludes our meeting. Thank you.